In today's video, do you want more testosterone? It's simple, walk more. We're talking science with Steve. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Paul Ravella and Steven Bogran from Pro Physique. And today we're gonna to talk about two studies that basically looked at sedentary versus some activity as simple as walking, maybe a little bit of squatting. And we're gonna talk about its effects on overall health and well being. And I think the outcome is gonna be quite shocking. I'm so happy with these studies because what they do is they make you recognize that the bar is nowhere near as high as people like to make you think it is sometimes. And it's such a beautiful thing to be like, hey, we can do something really simple that might have a pretty positive impact on the long term. So I don't need to dunk my face in a bowl of ice at 3.15 a.m. followed by sprints at 3.17 a.m. That sounds awful. Okay. I'd be sleeping. Yeah, that's a very, probably haven't seen it, but it's a guy that's going viral for this morning routine. He's obviously built like an Adonis, and I think people are like, oh man, that's what it takes. No, it's not what it takes, guys. Could you imagine if we were built like Adonises? We could sell everybody so many things. I know. <laughs> Use our powers for evil. Uh, but we're going to talk today about two studies. One was a very recent study, and one was just a couple of years ago. But um, let's talk about the the baseline for steps where they found people having a, an improvement in their overall testosterone and hormone levels. All right, so we're talking about that 2021 study. Yep. And essentially, like, if we want to make it as simple as possible, the threshold seems to be that anybody who got over 4,000 steps a day had better increases in overall just more testosterone. And anybody who had less than 4,000 steps a day tended to have a lower overall testosterone. Yeah, so when we're talking about 4,000 steps a day, so you guys can actually correlate what that is, I went to the track the other day and counted my steps, not with a counter. I literally counted one, two, three, and I walked until I got for 15 minutes and it was about 400 steps. That sounds awful. Right? So it can be quite a while to walk. You know, step counting is something that, you know, I think the, the, the idea that 10,000 steps a day is realistic it's not always like that takes some effort. It definitely takes effort. Uh, and it might not be realistic for everybody, especially like, like to be fair, we have yeah. pretty sedentary jobs for the most part. We're yeah. sitting behind a computer doing videos and typing out responses to everybody all day. So I actually got one day 3000 steps. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. Yeah, like I was like, oh my Lord, like I literally got up and that was with going to the gym. <laughs> but you drive to the gym, you sit on a machine, you train and you drive home. So, you know, now I have my walking treadmill and I have three rug rats under the age of 11. So like, I don't get to sit still as much as I used to, but it's pretty easy to fall into that, you know, wake up, go to work, come home, sit on the couch, go to bed, wake up, go to, and at no point are you forcing yourself to move. Yeah, and I think if you live in other places, like a, we'll say a lot of European countries, for instance, they have a lot of, you know, big cities that make it easy to be walkable and to use public transport. And so it's much more likely that you're going to have a more active life. So I was in New York recently. And the one thing I noticed, there are not anybody overweight in New York. They're walking everywhere, like walking around the city of Manhattan. I was like, I actually made a mental note to try to look for overweight people. And it was pretty rare yeah. versus like, you know, you know, you go to some of the bigger cities that I don't want to say any names. I don't want to call any people out, but we go to some the drivable cities. cities, the ones where if you don't where, have a car, where you, you can't have exist. to drive. I'm going to say Dallas, Texas, because every time we go there, I'm like, man, it's 30 minutes to get anywhere. Yeah. From the Airbnb to the gym to the convention center. It's like you, you're always driving. It also feels like it's 140 degrees out every time we're there. It's because it was in August. <laughs> Shocking. Dallas is hot people. But so like there, what you notice is oh it's rare to see somebody in very good physical shape. Yeah. So I think that's a strong correlation that I don't think many people would associate walking with positive health. I mean, maybe nowadays a little bit more. I think people definitely wouldn't correlate it with testosterone and like right. having a high testosterone. And for what most guys don't recognize, especially as you're aging, you know, generally speaking, most people are sedentary. And so yeah. testosterone starts probably going down around 35 and up but testosterone can have a huge impact on your overall quality of life. So it is an important thing to have in consideration of as we're aging, how are we taking care of our body and making sure that it's taking care of things like our minds and our feelings so that we can make the most out of the years that we do have. Yeah, and, and I can just say from my own personal experience that since I got my inclined walking treadmill that I used for my first prep in 2018, I've had just such a positive response to that. I've stayed leaner, easier, 
I've, I've felt healthier yeah. um, and I've had less like overall injuries and kind of changes to body composition just through walking more. Um, but for me, it was the ease of access. Right. And convenience is absolute key, yeah. which is why it's so important that we find easy, convenient yeah. ways that are realistic for us to make these things work. So let's, yeah. what do we want to get into about that second study? Well, the second study was interesting because they actually tried a few different variations of movement throughout the day. They had one group that was walking for like 30 minutes, mm -hmm. one group that was walking for three minutes at a time every 45 minutes. Yep. And then one group that was doing, was it 10 body weight squats? 10 body weight squats. Every 45 minutes. And everybody in here was classified as at least obese. Yeah, that was all males. I think it was 18 of them. They were all obese. And what was nice, it was a, they, they all did each stage. Yes. They all did everything. So it wasn't as if somebody was a hyper responder versus a non. It was like, no, this guy had the same response to each, you know, different type of activity. So we could yeah. see how he was, what was, what was best for that person. And this one is new. So it's 2024. So it's stuck behind a paywall. This is why we wanted to talk about two today, because you're only going to yeah. be able to see the abstract on this one for a while. Well, clearly the group that was sitting for eight and a half hours straight and doing nothing. <laughs> it's not good. Wasn't good. Well, and we've known this for quite a while that sedentary time and time seated without activity is its own problem for health. It's its own marker that says, yeah, this is not a good thing. It's just like we know that not getting enough exercise is a problem. So it's yeah. sitting too long. I've, I've heard it said that sitting is the new smoking. <laughs> Since nobody smokes anymore, I'm like, well, that might be a stretch. I don't think anyone's going to get lung cancer from sitting in a chair all day. But obesity is probably a cancer risk in itself. It's probably going to have some really negative health outcomes. So I don't hate the correlation of saying like sitting can be unhealthy. And they were really looking at uh, like glucose response and insulin response stuff yeah. with this. And I think their findings were fairly straightforward from my understanding of physiology. Yeah. But that's probably more than what most people do have. So this idea that when you do something like body weight squats, because yeah. of how that works, something called GLUT4, kind of think about like octopus arms, it comes out and it helps do insulin's job for it by bringing glucose and nutrients into the cell. So of course that insulin response is gonna be shunted there. And that was one of the big things that they were looking at in that study yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, and you know, we've talked about studies in the past where the, the group that did the 10 minute walk after each meal had a positive response, better energy throughout the day, less like blood sugar crashing. So. I don't think that there's any negatives in walking more or making walking a part of your daily kind of strategy. I don't know many people, I like, I, I guess I could have, but sitting at my desk, getting up for 45 minutes, doing 10 squats, sitting back down. Um, you know, I used to in my office, when I would get fatigued, I would do 50 jumping jacks. It would get my heart rate up and it would kind of reinvigorate me without having to do caffeine. I've also seen, you know, when I was looking up stuff for this, I saw some research that suggested that exercise or exercising your movement had a better impact on testosterone than just caloric restriction alone. So there just seems to be something about using our bodies. It's designed to be used. Yeah, and I think one of the other things to go back to that convenience point is that you also don't have to do something like get up and do jumping jacks. Maybe no, no, you get true. up and you just pace around the office for a little bit. You take a couple yeah. of laps up and down the cubicles. You go up and down the stairs once or twice every hour or so it's still positive improvement, which means that it's going to have a positive impact on things like those blood sugar level markers um, and your yeah. overall health risk. Yeah, I think when you start looking for opportunities to walk more, I th there's a group of us soccer dads when I'm out <laughs> at soccer practice that literally I have two sons playing on different fields. I walk around the fields the entire time and there's a group of us doing it. I, you know, I, I joke with them um, that they're also walking, but same thing like when we travel in an airport, Sometimes I'll take that opportunity. I call it airport cardio. Yep. I don't just sit there and wait for the flight. If I got 45 minutes, mm -hmm. I'm just pacing back and forth. And there are all ways to help not only, yes, positively influence your health, but also positively influence your weight and your physique to where you want it to be. Yeah. I mean, for me, the biggest benefit is I know if I do a 30 minute incline walk and I break a little bit of a sweat and I sit down to work, I'm like switched on versus if I just sit down and start working. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So it has a, a profound impact. So. Bottom line here, guys, research is just showing kind of what we've known, but it's it's cool to be backed up with some science. Yeah, it's always nice to have that secondary, like, yeah, you're right. Thank you, justification of the world. Well, and I think a lot of the research that's done nowadays is based on, okay, somebody saw this outcome, what was it? Let's look at the yeah. mechanism behind it, because a lot of times things are misunderstood, like fasted cardio. Like people assume that because you're fasted, that's a whole other topic, but you're burning more fat because you're preferentially burning fat. Anyway, 
the idea is that the mechanism is sometimes missed because the anecdote is just right. You know, the message is right, but the you know the 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 point is missed. Best practices is what's being done that's getting anecdotal evidence yeah. and making progress in the real world and what science talking about in research and making those things come together. Yeah, and understand like guys like Steven and I, as much as we love research, it takes a different type of person to yeah. perform that. So in that mind, I've I've had some talks with Brad Schoenfeld. I saw him speak a couple of weeks ago and I've invited him to come on the podcast. He has. He's definitely the most prolific researcher in the space of hypertrophy and yep. probably fat loss. And um, on that note, everybody stop by Coach Adams page and congratulate him on his successful thesis defensive and becoming Dr. Ibrahim. Dr. Adam Ibrahim. And that's it. Yeah, we gotta call him doctor now. I'm not gonna do that at all. <laughs> Dr. Evo. Yeah, so Coach Adam of our team uh, just completed it. So I'm wondering now, he's probably gonna wanna be busy with work. He's been stuck in that lab underground for years. Hey, we'll find out. In Tennessee, so yeah, congratulations, Adam. And, and also, you know, to all the great researchers out there, you know, we're friends with people like Eric Trexler, Eric Helms, Dr. Brett Contreras. You know, the, the the research that is done is such a challenge and it's such a delayed gratification on doing a study and then getting an outcome a year or two later and then a year or two later from that it gets published. Yeah, and all the money that it costs. Too. Yeah, the money, the time. So just understand that the research that we have, we gotta be thankful for yep. and not be negative about, oh, well, who funded it? Oh, who did this? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta assume that researchers are mostly pure of intention, and, and I do. Okay, he doesn't. All right. <laughs> well, this is why we review the research and look at the methods. But that is why we will talk to you guys tomorrow. <laughs>